We have a major Game Boy adaptation of a Super Nintendo game this week, albeit one I've already covered, along with the actual Super Nintendo version of Desert Strike, or rather Jungle Strike, as we cover Nintendo Power number 74 for July of 1994. Our cover game for this issue is Donkey Kong Land for the Game Boy, with some pre-rendered graphics and in color, not monochrome like the actual Game Boy game is. In the letters column, we actually have a prompt this issue asking... As to what should become of the Super Nintendo now that the N64 is coming out, the well, general consensus is that the super, that the NES stuck around for a few years after the Super Nintendo's release. The same thing should be the case for for the Super Nintendo. And that's pretty much how it pans out, actually. A couple new games in the Super Nintendo Top 20: We have Killer Instinct, Secret of Evermore, and NFL Quarterback Club. However, more notable, I would say, would be our Hall of Fame inductees this uh, issue, all of which tend towards the fantasy role-playing game with Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, and Dragon Warrior, all of whom are worthy members and all of whom are landmark titles for the platform and, indeed, for their respective genres. Now we have the Game Boy installment of Donkey Kong Country, this time with uh, Donkey Kong Land. There are maps of the first two worlds, and notes for worlds 3 and 4. I have some issues with the font color selection in this article, though. There are quite a few bits which has white text on a white background, which is not cool, and basic level, um, you know, magazine layout there. That's something that should have been spotted early on in the proofing process. Also, going from the notes we see here, there are no minecart levels in the game. However, I also previously played this game in Nintendo Power Rich Respectives, episode 91, so I'll be giving it a miss this time. Uh, I will have a link in the show notes to where you can find that it, that episode. Now, perhaps the bigger th thing is we've had our first E3, and the article get, gets to announcements for Nintendo systems, including Doom and Mortal Kombat 3 for the Super Nintendo. There's no mention of the N64's delay here, nor is any discussion of the major console announcements that happened this E3, this first E3, from Sega and Sony, those I will cover in a next-gen magazine recap on the blog. Next game we have, the one, first one I'll actually be doing coverage of for this issue, is Judge Dredd, which starts off as a licensed game based on the movie and then proceeds further from that into the Dark Judges storyline from the comics. The article gives notes on bonuses for sending enemies to the ISO cubes instead of killing them, along with maps and partial notes for most of the game, along with where it skews away from the film's story. Judge Dredd isn't a terrible game, but it runs into some issues with having to, or trying to, meld some run-and-gun gameplay with the controls and fluid animations of a cinematic platformer, causing a problem where the game is trying to present the animation of the character with a degree of semi-fluidity that the controls can't quite match. This is probably best seen when you're trying to crouch and shoot. The animation for going into a crouch is a little too involved to allow me to react as fast as enemies do, combined with Dread taking a bit, just a little too much damage from enemies. Also, on top of this, it's a, it's a toggle crouch. You, when you crouch, you stay crouched as opposed to just quickly going down so you can snap off a couple shots and then going back up to full height so you can keep moving instead of just going around crouch walking. In short, and in summary, Judge Dredd is a game that controls like Blackthorn or Out of This World, but expects you to move around in, through your environments like Alien 3 or Metroid. And that's why this game basically doesn't quite work. Again, not terrible, but has some significant flaws that prevent it from truly being as fun as it could be. We have an informative article here on advanced computer modeling, which is the technology used to make the pre-rendered sprites for Rare's games like Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Country. The general technical level of the article is pretty basic, but considering the general audience for Nintendo Power, combined with probably not a lot of them having played many PC games by this point, um, of our 3D ones, particularly since there aren't a ton of them at this time, it's not too surprising. We have an article on uh, Power Instinct, the fighting game that I covered in Nintendo Power Retrospectives 99, uh, in a one of the best of the rest episodes at this point here as well. So again, I'll refer you to that for my thoughts on the game. The article itself is general notes on the characters and their moves and that sort of thing. 
Continuing with the cinematic platformers in terms of the games we're actually covering, we have Nosferatu, a cinematic platformer of the Prince of Persia style that was featured on Game Center CX. The article is maps of the first two stages. Nosferatu is kind of a cross between Castlevania and Prince of Persia. The movement has the same fluidity and animation and deliberateness of control as Prince of Persia. It even has its hidden time limit, where if you take too long to reach the end of the game, you receive the bad ending. And like Prince of Persia, it has semi-unlimited continues, in the sense that you die one time too many, you're guaranteed to get the game's bad ending. Where it gets into Castlevania territory is the gothic environments of the game and the fact that you're basically contending with the monster mash. Um, boss of the first level is the Wolfman, and as you proceed through the game, you're going to run into like Frankenstein's monster and mummies and that sort of thing. The game is alright, though I will admit that the cin whole cinematic platformer genre is something of an acquired taste. In the Epic Center column, we have notes on a bunch of new upcoming titles from Enix, None of them are getting U.S. releases. We have uh, Dragon Quest VI. Doesn't come out in the snap. Well, it comes out in Japan. Doesn't come out in the U.S. Seventh Saga 2, Same thing. And a couple of these are games which probably were never going to get a chance of getting U.S. release on the SNES in the first place. Uh, Dark Half and Tactics Ogre. Uh, Dark Half, um, you like split between two point of view characters. One is the hero who's going to fight the Dark Dark Lord. The other one is the Dark Lord trying to regain their power after being overthrown themselves. And in the latter case, you level up your character by going through villages and murdering everyone there, including priests, women, and children, which wasn't going to make it past Nintendo's censorship policy, even after it loosened things up at this point. Actually, I do own the, both of those latter two, and I think I might have Seventh Saga 2 somewhere. Um, definitely own a copy of Dragon Quest VI for this uh, SNES. I picked up most of the Super, Nintendo, Super Famicom Dragon Quest games. Moving on, uh, we have the continuation of the previews of Chrono Trigger with description of the plot getting into the first three time periods, present, past, and future, including some detail notes like about the trial in the game, uh, about having to thwart the time paradox with uh, Marl, that sort of thing. We have next a rundown of some import JRPG titles on top of the Enix titles covered earlier. Presumably the Enix titles at this point, there was a chance they would come out in the U.S. Um, we have RPG Maker, Wonder Project J, Derby Simulator, Night of the Kimitachi, which made a Game Center CX, the translated title that is Night of the Sickle Weasel. But the big ones here in my book are Front Mission, which has like really great mech combat strategy RPG um, of on the Battletech level of granularity, and then the Super Robot Wars series. Moving on in the Epic Strategy column, the tips for Earthbound continue, and I've already reviewed that game, so I'm not going to get too much into that from here. Then in the Classified Information column, we actually have a big, um, a, a big little cheat, I would say. Um, big in its, I would say, its significance, and in a way it's kind of a callback to the old days, little in terms of it doesn't actually affect gameplay much. It is There is a code to view the programming credits for the Super Game Boy. It's been a while since the last sports scene column, and we don't have a lot of games featured here. There is a Bassmaster Classic and a Head-On Soccer, and Kyle Petty's No Fear Racing. Um, I find racing games generally pretty enjoyable and straightforward to review. Um, I'm going to take a look at this issue's racing game and kind of break with my trend of not of skipping over the sports titles entirely. Kyle Petty's No Fear Racing is an arcade-style racing game that is also bizarrely trying to be simulationist in ways that don't entirely work, like having limited fuel and tire life combined with the major flaw that the game appears to be trying to replicate the structure of real-world real world tracks, but is attempting to do so by basically playing a pre-rendered sort of version of the track like a video as you play each race, causing the track to stutter sluggishly at slower speeds, and then once you get up to like going 100-something miles an hour, playing at fast enough speeds 
so as to make it impossible to make a pit stop, to refuel, change your tires, all those things you need to do in order to complete the race because the entrance window for the actual track or for the pit stop is too small for you to get in there even if you dramatically decelerate. Next up is SWAT Cats, a run-and-gun shooter based on the then-currently airing Hanna-Barbera cartoon. I thought it's been more of a shoot 'em up since the focus of the show, that I watched as a kid, was more on the plane than the actual SWAT cats running around. In any case, we have notes on the first four stages. SWAT cats is a game I wish I could like. The show was one of my favorite Hanna-Barbera cartoons of the mid to late 90s, and I would go out of my way to watch the show on Cartoon Network when it was aired in reruns. If this show had toys, I would have bought them. So color me intensely disappointed that the video game adaptation of the show is so very frustrating. The controls themselves are responsive, and the graphics have some nice touches and flair to them. And the structure of the game itself feels like it should work, as it takes the it borrows the Mega Man concept of going through a variety of levels, each involving taking on antagonists from the show in the order of your choosing. When I found out the game also had a level up mechanic immediately after I started playing, I was also further engaged and excited looking forward to seeing how the level up mechanic was going to work in this game, how it was going to articulate. And then I started going through the first level and found myself more and more frustrated. Like The game's jump is incredibly clunky. The jump for the characters is lower than what power-up or collectible placement of the level could imply they would be able to make, combined with issues with like clear cases in level environments where there is upper levels that you should theoretically be able to navigate, and clearly the designers intended you to be able to navigate, but then you jump and you can't even you can't get them close to clearing them or getting up on top of them. Just further what further issues with this. The initial shot for your weapon is only facing forward and has a dramatically short range, and leveling up doesn't appear to extend the, the range of your shot at all. Then, in the middle version of, um, portion of the first stage, you are put behind the wheels of the SWAT Cat's jet, or wheels controls, I should say, of the SWAT Cat's jet, and what should be a fun and engaging on-rail shoot-up sequence, because the parts where you're where the, they're flying around the jet is some of the most spectacular portions of the show. Only for it to turn out very cl uh, tiresome, clunky, and repetitive, and on top of all that, you can't fail it. It's like the world's worst possible quick time event where it's long involved but really easy to fail and have to start over on but at no point does it just go nope we're done you just have to keep playing it and keep playing it until you get 100 percent perfectly right even after you're actually bored and tired and want to do something else i came in this game wanting to like it now i just wish it didn't exist now we have the Super Nintendo version of Juggle Strike after covering the Game Boy version. As before, there are basic notes on the first stage, along with some more in-depth notes on successive stages. Juggle Strike is a game with some balance issues. While with this version of the game, I got a better grasp of what I needed to do in the first stage than I did in the Game Boy version, it was still not without some very real problems. Maneuvering around the rocket launching vans that you face in the first stage is actually unpleasantly difficult, aggravated by the fact that the helicopter is only really capable of forwards and backwards movement combined with some horizontal rotation, but not horizontal movement. In short, you can't really bank sideways to avoid rocket fire the same way that actual helicopters can. This is all aggravated by the fact that the first stage has very little in health pickups. After managing to fend off the attackers going after the Library of Congress, I was re rewarded by the last enemy dropping a health pickup, and I'd hoped that the last enemy at the next area would do the same, and much to my annoyance, they did not. It makes for a pretty frustrating experience, which I would say moves this game into the category of titles that I still probably actually enjoy playing, but only through means that allow for save scumming. In Counselor's Corner, we have some questions about the puzzle rooms in Brandish, and some quick ways to level up and get cash in Might and Magic 3. We next have a beat-em-up based on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, with notes on six stages. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, from a gameplay standpoint, is closer to Kung Fu or Spartan X on the NES when it comes to the style of belt-based brawler it emulates. 
it's a it's a big innovation on the concept is it gives you an additional plane of movement in the background that you can switch between like with the uh, Fatal Fury games. That said, it's otherwise a pretty mediocre brawler. Unlike Final, F Final Fight or other brawlers, continuing forces you to restart the stage at the beginning as opposed to just dropping you off where you um, hit the continue button at. Additionally, your stock melee attack, rather than a series of animations forming a combo, instead is just a single animation repeated, and not helped by some of the animations being not great from a character standpoint, like the female characters having a slap for their attack animation instead of a more conventional strike. It's not a terrible game, but it's not great either. Moving back to the Game Boy, we have Animaniacs, with notes on the first three stages, each using the Bat Studio Backlot soundstage concept to set up different stages of the game. Animaniacs for the Game Boy is basically a perfectly executed licensed platformer for the system. The sprites are perfectly scaled for their environment in a way that allows them to have a sense of style and character that reflects their source material, while still allowing them to manage the uh, movements that the levels ask of them. And conversely, the game's levels are designed in a way that work with the size of the sprites, not requiring precise platforming with a high penalty in environments that the, where the player can't see where they're going, and combined with more of a focus on puzzle-based traversal as opposed to precise jumps and equally precise combat. It's just that where the game stumbles is executing the level of humor that made Animaniacs work. It's never quite subversive enough. Animaniacs as a series basically worked about as blue as the network sensors would let them get away with for a much more clearly aimed at kids show put out by Warner Brothers on Fox. And because of that, the sensors actually managed to get let them get away with a lot without necessarily getting into super ex uh, explicitly gross out humor as like the Nicktoons did with Rocco's Modern Life and Ren and Stimpy and that sort of thing. So, when the game's humor is so spectacularly underwhelming, that's actually kind of a bummer. Um, to be honest. I mean, compared to this... The humor in this game just is blah. It's sub tiny tunes in terms of how far it's willing to go. Our last game for this issue is a port of World Heroes 2 for the Game Boy, with super deformed characters like the Game Boy version of Samurai Showdown with World Heroes 2 Jet. World Heroes 2 Jet probably has the largest cast of any fighting game on the Game Boy to date. At least as of the uh, by date I mean this issue of Nintendo Power, not date when I'm as when I'm recording this. And the game handles that cast remarkably well. The game divides the tournament into a series of blocks of four, where you fight a series of opponents in one round matches. If you win more than you lose, you advance. The moves in the game are executed well, with decent animations to them, and the super deformed sprites still get across something of the characters they represent from their source material in an exaggerated form, from Brocken being an XB of Strollheim from the Battle Tendency arc of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, to Jian doing an Ojo-sama laugh when she wins. Now, I've skipped over a lot of World uh, of a Game Boy fighting games, because like Mortal Kombat, they've been terrible. They've attempted to replicate one for one, the way the game plays in a portable form, both on a system with less graphical um, ability and less buttons. World Heroes 2 Jet is a game where the developers recognize that just mimicking World Heroes on a portable system is, isn't possible, so don't bother, don't try. Instead, they stuck to what the essence of each game is and worked from there. I am very impressed with this game. It's not necessarily going to be my pick of the issue because of how fighting games on the Game Boy work in terms of multiplayer, but it is still a game that is worth your and my time. In the now playing column, our Ulcer Rans are Hanna Barbera's Turbo Toon and Syndicate. The second one, at least, is nothing to sneeze at. And then in Pack Watch, we have our first look at Donkey Kong Country 2, which puts, um, Donkey Kong himself on the uh, back burner in favor of Diddy and Dixie Kong, 
Then there we have Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, Mutant Chronicles, Wildcats, based on the uh, comic book, and then Castlevania Dracula X. My pick of the week for this issue was almost, almost World Heroes 2 Jet. That was, quite, quite frankly, the best portable version of a fighting game we've covered thus far for the show. It controls incredibly well, has a tremendous sense of character, and has a really strong just sense of flair to it that makes it engaging and fun to play. The thing is, with how I like to do my fighting games for recommendations, is the for a good fighting game recommendation, it's also important to have, well, the two-player aspect as well. And honestly, ultimately, Game Boy fighting games, you have to have two Game Boys to do them, do multiplayer with them, so it's getting two copies. Not saying it's impossible to do that, but I am, and guys get two copies and a link cable and that sort of thing. But ultimately, I think that the game works, like, it, it, it hampers the utility of doing a recommendation of it. So instead, my pick is going to be Jungle Strike. Keeping in mind that my main way for playing Super Nintendo physical cartridges at the moment is a Retron 5, which allows for safe scumming, and that's pretty much how it's going to stay until I get the Polymega when that comes out, which will also allow for safe scumming. Because I... Not just because they make it easier to play these games on a high definition television, but also it the the ability to engage in save scumming is a quality of life improvement, I would say, for retro gaming. You still have to go through the actual physical effort and motions to complete the task that you're trying to do to beat the game, but it deals with issues regarding limited continues and that sort of thing in games, which have no real reason to have limited continues. Next issue, the cover thing is a Virtual Boy special. So, we will see how much of this issue, if it's a just straight up all Virtual Boy thing, since most of the big Virtual Boy titles were launch titles, or if we have just a smattering of other games in there to give us something to actually talk about. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.